Hello, my name is Dale and welcome to Beginner's Resin 101, The Essential Tools. So we're just going to show a couple of the tools that you might want to start investing in if you're going to come start using the uh, resin epoxy to create more depth with any type of art that you are already creating. Uh, there's only a few things that you really need to use and we're going to go over those right now. Uh, later we'll go over some more of the supplies you'll need and then uh, we'll get into uh, eventually some projects that you can make. So we'll start with beginning projects and then we'll make our way up to more advanced stuff. Uh, but it really doesn't take a lot to get going on this. Resin comes in a lot of different um, sizes so I would suggest starting with a small amount that way you can do a little bit of practicing to see if you really want to get into this because resin can be quite expensive. Um, a few safety pieces of equipment that you're going to need. Um, you're going to want some type of a respirator and this is not just a particle uh, respirator this is something that is going to help with the fumes. Uh, most resins, as long as you're looking for something that has no VOCs, um, is actually safe to use uh, as long as you have a well-ventilated area. Um, however, sometimes, especially when you're heating things up, um, it can give off a little bit of a smell. Uh, and so just for safety precautions, you want to use a respirator. It's really not that big of a deal. It's great to have. Uh, this is something that you would want to use if you're going to be using... Um, spraying shellac or urethane or even paint. So it's really handy to have. Um, these respirators uh, just come right on, this filter um, that you then uh, switch every once in a while. Uh, this is not really for sanding, however. Um, this is mainly for some fumes. So that would be one thing as a respirator. Another thing that you're gonna to want to use is gloves. You always wanna keep um, some type of barrier between yourself and the resin epoxy. Um, when you mix the resin with the hardener, uh, it is a chemical reaction and it actually gives off a lot of heat uh, and that can actually burn your skin and it's a very uh, much of an irritant on your skin as well. Um, a lot of people will use uh, nitrile gloves um, these would be disposable, so you would use them one time or uh, you might even use multiple ones in a single project. Something I don't really like to do, I try to be as sustainable as possible. Um, and, and what I use instead is I actually use some coated uh, work gloves. Uh, these work really well, they're, they're pretty tight on your hands, um, so you can kind of pick things up if you need to. Um, but they work really well and I will use these over and over and over again. Um, I've had a pair for over a year. I've only just recently got some new ones um, and I'm really liking these ones. These are from uh, Gorilla Glue um, and they work really well for me. If I know I'm going to be doing a lot, sometimes I'll actually combine. So I might put nitro gloves on and then put these on, on underneath it for extra protection. Um, and as long as I don't get any resin on the gloves, I can actually reuse these gloves as well. So that is another piece of equipment that you want. Um, goggles is a good thing to have because you will be um, using a heat gun, which is going to kind of move things around and you don't want any accidents to happen. So goggles is a good one to have. The next thing that's really important when it comes to the resin is actually your heat gun. Heat guns are not too expensive. Uh, and something that you want to look for um, in a heat gun is you want the variable um, heat setting and most often than not you're going to be having it on the hottest setting it can be. Uh, you can turn it all the way to the coolest and that's going to just be blowing cool air which is something, uh, believe it or not, I actually use it sometimes to clean areas um, just to clean dust because dust is definitely the enemy when it comes to resin. Um, and I like the variable speed, so I have three different speeds. And when I'm doing my resin projects, I'm typically using it on high heat and high speed. Um, something that you want is an attachment. Um, you want one of these because you really want to be able to um, focus 
uh, the heat and um, this is going to really help you create those cells uh, if you're going to be adding white if you're doing like ocean pour um, so most of these come with uh, these different attachments but just watch for that Another thing I like to have is uh, this right here, this little kickstand um, makes it so you can put it up like this um, when you're, you've done a, a project and you need to take the drips off the bottom. You can set it up like this and heat up the bottom and then just take um, a scraper and just scrape those, those drips right off. So a heat gun is super important um, and really not that expensive. Uh, they take a lot of abuse. Uh, my last heat gun, which was this one, I just bought a new one, uh, lasted me about two years. Um, so you might be able to find maybe a little bit better quality, but this worked for me uh, and I've used it a lot. The other piece of equipment that's really important, um, and this is to pop all those bubbles, and sometimes you need to reheat things up to, because you've got some dog hair in or I'm a zookeeper, so it might not be dog hair. It could be all different types of hair um, that I can get into my resin, which is a real bummer. Uh, but you want to have uh, a butane torch. This is very uh, similar to uh, a culinary torch. Uh, sometimes that's what you're going to be looking for. Um, and uh, what I like is I like the little viewer um, that actually can show you how much gas is in there. Uh, if you haven't used these before, it's really important never to go above your max. I like to keep it underneath that when you're filling it. Uh, the reason for that is when you're heating things up, um, if it is above this max, uh, sometimes the flame comes out a little sporadically and it can super, super heat and kind of ruin your resin. Um, don't worry, resin is actually really forgiving. So even if you make a mistake, you just let it cure for two days, get some sandpaper, sand it, and you can re-pour a thin pour and save what you thought might be a ruined piece. So this is very, very important. Um, and then of course, if you're gonna get that, you gotta make sure that you get the uh, fuel to go with it. Uh, so again, this is a butane uh, torch and I have butane gas. Um, here and it's pretty easy there's a little hole in the bottom and so you see that little red valve and the red valve just goes in and you push it and it will go in and you don't need to do it that long and the fuel just goes right in there so those are the most important tools uh, that you can have for your resin there are a lot of different ways we'll get into mixing and other things too um, I personally like to use uh, a scale and I actually weigh my resin out because I will do really small projects that uses a very small amount of resin um, and literally it's so small that it fits into this little silicone cup uh, and I can measure that on here um, or I can do big projects uh, and again, measure it. Uh, the nice thing about actually measuring it out is when you're trying to calculate how much your project cost you, you can then figure out how exactly how much resin you used just by weighing it, calculate the cost, and then make sure you're putting that into your product, um, the end cost price for yourself. Um, some other things that I like to have, eventually you're going to be doing some sanding, so it's great to have, um, you can have a little block sander like this, you can have a, a, a hand sander, those work great too. Uh, another must have is going to be denatured alcohol, this is your best friend. Uh, this is a way to clean up um, after yourself. Uh, if you get resin on your gloves, you just take a little bit of rag and this denatured alcohol and you can clean those right off your gloves and that way you can use these gloves for a real long time. Um, I also like to get these silicone mats here. Um, resin does not stick to silicone. So if you pour on it and it goes onto these mats, again, you just let it sit for a day or two and it peels right up. Um, I actually save all the little drips. I have all kinds of containers. Uh, I can then use those in other projects, uh, whether I'm making 
um, like a stained glass project um, or even fairy house type stuff. There's all kinds of stuff that you can use those drips. So don't throw those away. I also like to use uh, silicone cups and they come in a variety of sizes. And this is probably the most common one that I use is right here. Uh, this holds 250 mLs. Um, so I can do all my mixing in here and then I can pour into smaller containers. This is about 100 mL. Uh, and then if I'm going into like a 10 mL, this is what I might put my white in. Uh, so these are some more tools that you might want to invest in. I've literally had these now for a couple of years and I just keep being able to use them again and again. They, they're made out of silicone. It's the same stuff that you would make your mat out of. Um, so once it dries, you just flip it and you can take the resin out and then you can um, use your denatured alcohol to clean it and then do a quick little rinse and they're good to go again. Uh, you need to be able to stir. So some people will use just wooden uh, stir sticks. Again, I like to, I don't want to be putting too much in a trash. Uh, so I found these silicone, again, um, stir sticks. Uh, again, they work great. Uh, I've gotten years out of them. Uh, so this is a great way to stir it. You need something to be able to spread uh, once you put it on your project. Um, this is also a silicone. It's like a silicone brush. Um, so this is a really good investment. Um, I like these little stir sticks as well, also coated. Um, they're metal inside, so they're good and heavy. If I'm doing a small amount of a mix, um, I can just use this to mix it in here. Um, again, when I'm doing the white, I'll pour it in here and then mix it in here. So these are just really great. Again, they, they work for such a long time. Uh, you'll have to determine what type of epoxy you're going to use. It's really going to depend on what is available to you um, in your country. Um, not all resins are found in each country. Um, and there's a lot of different ones out there. So the one that I use is Total Boat. Um, there's two types that I use. I either use the tabletop epoxy or I will make the, use the maker epoxy. What's very important when you're picking an epoxy, look to make sure it has no VOCs. So that's the fumes that can be um, hazardous to you. So if it has no VOCs, you don't have to worry about that. You also want to make sure that um, it's an art um, epoxy. Um, so uh, the art epoxy uh, and this tabletop works great too. Um, this, once it dries, it is then food safe. So uh, the reason why a tabletop is good, you gotta think anytime you go to a bar and you find epoxy that's poured on the bar, if it's super shiny, it's probably epoxy. And uh, of course, if your food falls on it, um, people will pick it up and eat it. So, you know, it has to be food safe. Uh, so once it's cured and cure time is typically seven days, dries in about 24 hours, a full cure is usually seven days. So you will have to do a little bit of research into what is available in your area. Um, look at the prices as well. Um, you'll have to contact the, uh, the manufacturer, which is what I did with Tabletop, because I like to um, weigh it out, as I said. And if you look here, um, this is just the epoxy part, not the hardener, but this is a one-to-one -one mix ratio. So if I'm pouring um, in a container and some of those containers have that one-to-one -one on it, um, that means it's technically an equal amount of epoxy to the hardener um, in volume, not in weight. That's two different things. So I do weight. So if I'm doing weight, the ratio is 10, so I use 10 grams of epoxy, which is a very small amount, to 8.4 grams of hardener. So 10 grams to 8.4 equals 1.1 mix ratio. So that part's very important if you're going to be measuring 
um, the amount. And I highly recommend the, the weighing epoxy because um, you'll actually save money in the long run. It's a, it's a lot more precise. Um, a few other things we'll go through. We're going to go through this stuff in supplies uh, a little bit in another video. Uh, but just so you know what you're getting into, you want some type of a colorant to be able to go into your epoxy. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can use. You can actually just use acrylic paint um, can look really nice. But if you're looking for a few other um, uh, techniques to use, uh, something that looks a little bit different, if you're gonna use the uh, paint, uh, it looks nice. It gives a color, but there's not like a lot of pop in it. Uh, if you're looking for something translucent so you can see through it, uh, that's when you want to use some type of um, a alcohol-based ink. Okay, so alcohol inks are great for a translucent pour. And this translucent pour, you can put a single drop in just to give it a little shade of color or in and very very translucent or you can put a lot more drops in and you can have a hint of translucent so maybe you want to put a flower or something in there and you just want to barely be able to see it you'd put a little bit more of the alcohol in it but this helps keep it translucent you really want those super cool effects that everybody's looking for when they're doing the um resin epoxy uh, that's when you want to do um, a mica powder. Um, and I will often get mine from uh, Mermaid Trash. Um, that's here in the United States. Um, there are other types that I will use as well. Eye Candy is another good one, um, as well as Unicorn Art. Um, those are the three types that I will typically use. Um, so that is a mica powder. This is something that people use in makeup and they use in soap making and all kinds of stuff. So um, it is just a powder and you add that and sometimes it has sparkle in it. Sometimes it has a mixture of two different colors. Um, it gives a lot of uh, really cool depth. Um, so that's really neat. So you're going to need um, maybe mica powder. If you're going to be doing ocean pours and you want those white waves and those cells and stuff like that, you're going to want some type of a white colorant. It's a little bit different. Um, so the two products that I use, and I actually use them together. Um, I like this uh, Casting Craft White Pigment Concentrate. And I only, because I use such a small amount, I always use this. Um, I'm only using about two drops, two to three drops. And then at the same time, um, I typically will use also from Mermaid's Trash, um, either lace white or foam white and it's heat activated so once you pour that on there and you use your heat gun and it spreads out the heat gun the heat from the heat gun will actually start creating cells which can take 20 to 30 minutes for those cells to pop up um, painters tape is always good uh, if you're going to be doing something like a cutting board so it's square or a rectangle you can put um, just cheap old painters tape on the back um, and then once it all cured up you just hit it with the heat gun and you'll be able to just peel that right off that makes things a lot easier um, or you can just let it go on the back and then heat it up and take a scraper and just scrape it off and then sand it um, so those are a couple of other things and then another thing that I like to do again as I said dust is the enemy dust in hair is the enemy and so after you've, I don't know if you can hear, I'm in an old milled studio and I'm actually in the bottom floor and there's a studio right above me and they do some super cool um, sculpting, uh, but it's heavy work. And because this building is over a hundred years old, the dust is also over a hundred years old. So oftentimes as I'm epoxying, I can literally see all those little specks of dust falling onto the project that I just did. Um, we'll get into techniques to help minimize that um, and what we can do to kind of take that out before it becomes a problem. Uh, but just to keep it simple, one thing that I do for small projects, I just buy 
um, a whole bunch of these um, containers. And after I'm done with my project uh, and I see that it's dust free, I just put this right on top. And now it can be in here for that 24 hours and cure, and I don't have to worry about um, getting any more uh, dust in it. Um, I also have invested in some of these big ones. I say invested, but I personally just go to Ocean State Job Walk and I get a set of these really big, huge ones here um, for it's something like $8. So I have three of these for $8. I can do three big projects with that. And the last thing, and we'll kind of show you how to make this stuff yourself. Um, if you're doing a really big project and I've got a project table here and we've actually made tables for restaurants. Um, we have created our own tent system that we put on top of it. And after we do our clear pour, we can put that on and hope for the best. So I think that is all of the essential tools and some of the essential supplies that you will need to get going. Um, I will list this in the comments below for you to check out. Um, look at this stuff, start calculating prices. Um, if you are interested, the next video is gonna be a little bit more focused on supplies and maybe where to get those supplies. Uh, and then we will get into some fun projects. So we look forward to seeing you on the next time. Have any questions, please put them in the comments below. Because if you have a question, there's probably a minimum of 10 other people who have a question. So let's all ask our questions and different questions and we will learn from each other. Uh, with that, we will see you next time.